द एडवेंचर ऑफ हारून उल रशीद पार्ट थ्री द स्टोरी ऑफ सादी नुमान द खलीफा हारून उल रशीद वॉज मच प्लीज विद द टेल ऑफ द बैंक मैन एंड द जरवेश एंड वेन इट वॉज फिनिश्ड ही टर्न टू द यंग मैन हु हैड इल ट्रीटेड हिज हॉर्स एंड इंक्वायर हिज नेम ऑल्सो द यंग मैन रिप्लाई डेट ही वॉज कॉल सादी नुमान सादी नुमान ऑब्जर्व द खलीफा I have seen horses broken all my life long and have even broken them myself but I have never seen any horse broken in such a barbarous manner as by you yesterday everyone who had looked on was indignant and blamed you loudly as for myself i was so angry that i was very nearly disclosing who i was and putting a stop to it at once still You have not the air of a cruel man and I would gladly believe that you didn't act in this way without some reason as I am told that it was not the first time and indeed that every day you are to be seen flogging and spoiling your horse I wish to come to the bottom of the matter but tell me the whole truth and conceal nothing Saadi Numan changed color as he heard these words and his manner grew confused but he saw plainly that there was no help for it so he prostrated himself before the throne of the khalifa and tried to obey but the voice stuck in his throat and he remained silent the khalifa accustomed to he was to instant obedience guessed something of what was passing in the young man's mind and sought to put him at his ease saadi numan he said do not think of me as the khalifa but merely as a friend who would like to hear your story if there is anything in need that you are afraid may offend me take courage for i pardon you beforehand speak then openly and without fear as to one who knows and loves you we assured by the kindness of the khalifa saadi numan at length began his tale commander of the faithful said he reza jaf i am by the luster of your highness presence I will do my best to satisfy your wishes. I am by no means perfect, but I am not naturally cruel. Neither do I take pleasure in breaking the law. I admit that the treatment of my horse is calculated to give your highness a bad opinion of me and to set an evil example to others. Yet I have not tested it without reason, and I have hopes that I shall be judged more worthy of pity than punishment. commander of the faithful i will not trouble to describe my birth it is not of sufficient distinction to deserve your highness attention my ancestors were careful people and i inherited enough money to enable me to live comfortably tough without show having therefore a modest fortune the only thing wanting to my happiness was a wife who could return my affection but this blessing i was not destined to get For on the very day after my marriage my bride began to try my patience in every way that was most hard to bear now seeing that the customs of our land oblige us to marry without ever beholding the person with whom we are to pass our lives a man has of courage no right to complain as long as his wife is not absolutely repulsive or is not positively deformed and whatever defects her body may have present ways and good behavior will go far to remedy them the first time i saw my wife unveiled when she had been brought to my house with the usual ceremonies i was enchanted to find that i hadn't been deceived in regard to the account that had been given me of her beauty i began my married life in high spirits and the best hopes of happiness the following day a grand dinner was served to us but as my wife did not appear I ordered to call her still she didn't come and I waited impatiently for some time at last she entered the room and she took our places at the table and plates of rice were set before us I ate mine as was natural with a spoon but great was my surprise to notice that my wife instead of doing the same drew from her pocket a little case from which she selected a long pin and by the help of this pin conveyed her wise grain by grain to her mouth amina i exclaimed in astonishment is that the way you eat rice at home and did you do it because your appetite was so small 
or did you wish to count the grains so that you might never eat more than a certain number? If it was for economy and you are anxious to teach me not to be wasteful, you have no cause for alarm. We shall never ruin ourselves in that way. Our fortune is large enough for all our needs. Therefore, dear Amina, do not seek to check yourself, but eat as much as you desire, as I do. In reply to my affectionate words, I expected a cheerful answer. Yet, Amina said nothing to all, but continued to pick her voice as before, only at longer and longer intervals. And, instead of trying the other dishes, all she did was to put every now and then a crumb of bread into her mouth. That wouldn't have made a meal for a sparrow. I felt provoked by her obstinacy, but to excuse her to myself as far as I could. I suggested that perhaps she had never been used to eat in the company of men, and that her family might have taught her that she ought to behave nicely and discreetly in the presence of her husband. Likewise that she might either have dined already or instead to do so in her own apartments. So I took no further notice and when I had finished left the room, secretly much vexed at her strange conduct. The same thing occurred at supper and all through the next day. Whenever we ate together, it was quite clear that no woman could live upon two or three bread crumbs and a few grains of rice. And I determined to find out how and when she got food. I pretended not to pay attention to anything she did, in the hope that little by little she would get accustomed to me and become more friendly. But I soon saw that my acceptations were quite vain. One night I was lying with my eyes closed and to all appearance sound sleep when Amina arose softly and raised herself without making the slightest sound. I couldn't imagine what she was going to do and as my curiosity was great I made up my mind to follow her. When she was fully dressed she stole quietly from the room instead she had let the curtain fall behind her. I flung a garment on my shoulders and a pair of slippers on my feet looking for my lattice which opened into the court. I saw her in the act of passing through the street door, which she carefully left open. It was bright moonlight, so I easily managed to keep her inside, till she entered a cemetery not far from the house. There I hid myself under the shadow of the wall, and crouched down cautiously, and hardly was I concealed when I saw my wife approaching in company with a gaul one of those demons which as your highness is aware, when they about the country making their lairs in deserted buildings and springing out upon unwary travellers whose flesh they eat, if no life being goes their way, they then betake themselves to the cemeteries and feed upon the dead bodies. I was nearly stuck jumped with horror on seeing my wife with the hideous female girl. They passed by me without noticing me, began to dig up a corpse which had been buried that day and then sat down on the edge of the grave to enjoy their frightful repast, talking quietly and cheerfully all the while. I was too far off to hear what they said. When they had finished, they threw back the body into the grave and heaped back the earth upon it. I made no effort to disturb them and returned quickly to the house when I took care to leave the door open as I had previously found it. Then I got back into bed and pretended to sleep soundly. A short time after, Amina entered as quietly as she had gone out. As may be guessed, after such a scene it was long before I could close my eyes, and at the first sound which called the faithful to prayer, I put on my clothes and went to the mosque. But even prayer didn't restore peace to my troubled spirit, and I couldn't face my wife until I had made up my mind what future course I should pursue in regard to her. I therefore spent the morning roaming about from one garden to another, turning over various plans for compelling my wife to give up her horrible ways. I thought of using violence to make her submit, but felt to be unkind to her. I had a gentle means had the best chance of success, so a little suited, I turned towards home, which I reached about the hour of dinner. As soon as I appeared, Amina ordered dinner to be served and we sat down together. As usual, she persisted in only picking a few grains of rice, 
and I resolved to speak to her at once of what lay so heavily on my heart. Amina, when the day after our marriage you declined to eat anything but a few wives and altogether behaved in such a manner that most husbands would have been deeply wounded. However, I had patience with you and only tried to tempt your appetite by the dishes you choose. I could invent, but all to no purpose. Still, Amina, it seems to me that there is some among them as sweet to the taste as the flesh of a corpse. I had no sooner uttered these words than Amina, who instantly understood that I had followed her to the graveyard, was seized with a passion beyond any that I have ever witnessed. Her face became purple. Her eyes looked as if they would start from her head, and she positively foamed with rage. I watched her with terror, wondering what would happen next, but little thinking what would be the end of her fury. She seized a vessel of water that stood at hand and plunging her hand in it, murmured some words I failed to catch. Then, sprinkling it on my face, she cried madly, Receive the reward of your praying and become a joke. The words were not out of her mouth when, without feeling conscious that any change was passing over me, I suddenly knew that I had ceased to be a man. In the greatness of the shock and surprise, for I had no idea that Amina was a magician. I never dreamed of running away and stood rooted to the spot, while Amina grasped a stick and began to beat me. Indeed, her blows were so heavy that I only wondered they didn't kill me at once. However, they succeeded in rousing me from my stupor, and I dashed into the courtyard, followed closely by Amina, who made frantic dives at me, which I was not quick enough to dodge it. At last she got tired of pursing me, or else a new trick entered into her hand, which would give me speedy and painful death. She opened the gate leading into the street, intending to crush me as I passed through. Dog tough I was, I saw through her design and stung into presence of mind by the greatness of the danger. I timed my movements so well that I continued to rush through, and only the tip of my tail received a squeeze. As she banged the gate, I was safe, but my tail hurt me horribly, and I yelped and howled so loud all along the streets that the other dogs came and attacked me, which made matters no better. In order to avoid them, I took a refuge in a cookshop, where chunks and sheep's heads were sold. At first the owner showed me great kindness and drove away the other dogs that were still at my heels, while I crept into the darkest corner but tough I was safe for the moment. I was not disdained to remain longer under his protection, for he was one of those who hold all dogs to be unclean, and that all the washing in the world will hardly purify you from their contact. So after my enemies had gone to seek other prey, he tried to lure me from my corner in order to force me into the street. But I refused to come out of my hole and spend the night in sleep which I sorely needed after the pain inflicted on me by Amina. I have no wish to weary your highness by dwelling on the sad thoughts which accompanied my change of shape, but it may interest you to hear that the next morning my host went out early to do his marketing and returned laden with the ship's heads and tongues and tortoise that formed his stock in trade for the day. The smell of meat attracted various hungry dogs in the neighborhood and they gathered round the door, begging for some bits. I stole out of my corner and stood with them, in spite of his objection to dogs as unclean animals. My protector was a kind-hearted man, and knowing I had eaten nothing since yesterday, he threw me bigger and better bits than those which fell to the share of the other dogs. When I had finished, he tried to go back into the shop. A few paces further on was a baker's shop which seemed to have a gay and merry man of a monster. At that moment he was having his breakfast, and if I gave no signs of hunger, he at once threw me a piece of bread. Before gobbling it up, as most dogs are in the habit of doing, I bowed my head and waked my tail, in token of my thanks, and he understood and smiled pleasantly. I really didn't want the bread at all, but felt it would be ungracious to refuse, so I ate it slowly in order that he might see that I only did it out of politeness. He understood this also and seemed quite willing to let me stay in his shop.
So I sat down with my face to the door to show that I only asked his protection. This he gave me and indeed encouraged me to come into the house itself, giving me a corner where I might sleep without being in anybody's way. The kindness heaped on me by this excellent man was far greater than I could ever have accepted. He was always affectionate in his manner of treating me, and I shared his breakfast, dinner, and supper, while on my side, I gave him all the gratitude and attachment to which he had arrived. I sat with my eyes fixed on him, and he never left the house without having me at his heels. And if it ever happened that when he was preparing to go out, I was asleep and didn't notice, he would call Rufus, Rufus, for that was the name he gave me. Some weeks passed in this way when one day a woman came in to buy bread. In paying for it, she laid on several pieces of money, one of which was bad. The baker perceived this and declined to take it, demanding another in its place. The woman, for her part, refused to take it back, declaring it was perfectly good. But the baker would have nothing to do with it. It is really such a bad imitation, he exclaimed at last that even my dog wouldn't be taken it. Here Rufus, Rufus, and hearing his voice, I jumped onto the counter. The baker threw down the money before me and said, find out if there is a bad coin. I looked at it in turn and then laid my paw on the false one, glancing at the same time at my master so as to point it out. The baker, who had of course been only in joke, was surprised at my cleverness and the woman, who was at last convinced that the man spoke the truth, produced another piece of money in his place. When she had gone, my master was so pleased that he told all the neighbors what I had done, and made a great deal more of it than there really was. The neighbors very naturally declined to believe his story, and fried me several times with all the bad money they could collect together. But I never failed the test. Soon, the shop was filled from morning till night with people who on the pretense of buying bread came to see if I was as clever as I was reported to be. The baker drove a roaring trade and admitted that I was worth my weight in gold to him. Of course, there were plenty one envied him his large custom and many was the pitfall set for me so that he never dared to let me out of his sight. One day a woman who had not been in the shop before, came to ask for bread, like the rest. As usual, I was laying on the counter, and she threw down six coins before me, one of which was false. I detected it at once, and put my paw on it, looking as I did so at the woman. Yes, she said, nodding her head. You are quite right. That is the one. She stood gazing at me attentively for some time, then paid for the bread, and left the shop making a sign for me to follow her secretly. Now my thoughts were always running on some means of shaking off the spell laid on me and noticing the way in which this woman had looked at me. The idea entered my head that perhaps she might have guessed what had happened and in this I was not deceived. However, I let her go on a little way and merely stood at the door, watching her. She turned and seeing that I was quite still, she again beckoned to me. The baker all this while was busy with his oven and had forgotten all about me. So I stole out softly and ran after the woman. When we came to her house, which was some distance off, she opened the door and then said to me, Come in, come in, you will never be sorry that you followed me. When I had entered, she fastened the door and took me into a large room where a beautiful girl was working at a piece of embroidery. My daughter, exclaimed my guide. I have bought you the famous dog belonging to the baker, which can tell good money from bad. You know that when I first heard of him, I told you I was sure he must be really a man, changed into a dog by magic. Today, I went to the baker's to prove for myself the truth of the story and persuaded the dog to follow me here. Now, what do you say? You are right, mother, replied the girl. And rising, she dipped her hand into a vessel of water. Then sprinkling it over me, she said, If you were born dog, we may dog, but if you were born man, by virtue of this water, we assume your proper form. In one moment, the spell was broken. The dog's chair vanished as if it had never been, and it was a man who stood before her. Overcome with gratitude at my deliverance, 
I flung myself at her feet and kissed the hem of her garment. How can I thank you for your goodness towards a stranger and for what you have done? Henceforth, I am your slave. Deal with me as you will. Then, in order to explain how I came to be changed into a dog, I told her my whole story and finished with rendering the mother the thanks due to her for the happiness she had brought me. Sadi Numan, return the daughter, say no more about the obligation you are under to us. The knowledge that we have been of service to you is ample payment. Let us speak of Amina, your wife with whom I was acquainted before her marriage. I was aware that she was a magician, and she knew too that I had studied the same art under the same mistress. We met often going to the same baths, but we didn't like each other. I never sought to become friends. As to what concerns you, it is not enough to have broken your spell. She must be punished for her wickedness. Remain for a moment with my mother, I beg. She added hastily. I will return shortly. Left alone with the mother, I again expressed the gratitude I felt to her as well as to her daughter. My daughter, she answered, is, as you see, as accomplished a magician as Amina herself. But you would be astonished at the amount of good she does by her knowledge. That is why I have never interfered. Otherwise, I should have put a stop to it long ago. As she spoke, her daughter entered with a small bottle in her hand. Sadi Numan, she said, the books I have just consulted tell me that Amina is not home at present, but she should return at any moment. I have likewise found out by their means that she pretends before the servants great uneasiness as to your absence. She has circulated a story that while at dinner with her, you remember something important business that had to be done at once and left the house without shutting the door. By this means, a dog had stayed in, which she was forced to get rid of by a stick. Go home then without delay, and await Amina's return in your room. When she come in, go down to meet her, and in her surprise, she will try to run away. Then have this bottle ready, and dash the water it contains over her, saying loudly, Receive the reward of your crimes. That is all I have to tell you. Everything happened exactly as the young magician had foretold. I hadn't been in my house many minutes before Amina returned, and as she approached, I stopped in front of her with the water in my hand. She gave one loud cry and turned to the door, but she was too late. I had already dashed the water in her face and spoken the magic words. Amina disappeared, and in her place stood the horse you saw me beating yesterday. This commander of faithful is my story, and may I venture to hope that now you have heard the reason of my conduct. Your Highness will not think this wicked woman too harshly treated. Sadi Numan replied the Khalifa, your story is indeed a strange one, and there is no excuse to be offered for your wife. But without condemning your treatment of her, I wish you to reflect how much she must suffer from being changed into an animal and I hope you will let that punishment be enough. I do not order you to insist upon the young magician finding the means to restore your wife to her human shape, because I know that when once women such as she began to work evil, they never leave off, and I should only bring down on your head a vagueness far worse than the one you have undergone already. The adventure of Khalifa Harun al-Rashid is not ended here. To be continued.